Well, hello everyone, and uh, good morning, perhaps even good afternoon, depending where you're calling in from. And welcome to this hour-long <coughs> overview of motivational interviewing. One of the courses that we teach at C4, uh, because we think it's so foundational to all the best practices uh, that folks uh, can, can utilize who are involved in health and human services. So I should say that today is, uh, it's not a training per se, it's, it's a webcast, it's an overview, it's sort of like looking at motivational interviewing from a helicopter. Uh, we're going to move fairly quickly through the air, but uh, we'll linger here and there. But uh, just so you know, uh, this will move at a more rapid pace than a typical training, which we do want to have more, a more leisurely pace and be able to actually uh, look at things more deeply and also practice skills. But nonetheless, um, I think we'll have a, a nice little time today for an hour. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for typing in the chat box. And I'll invite you to continue doing so uh, as we do so a few other activities. My hope for you today is that uh, you'll have an ability to explain how it is that motivational interviewing differs from other counseling or case management or helping approaches in general, what distinguishes that, uh, also be able to identify what we call the, the spirit of MI, the four elements that we talk about, uh, those including engaging, focusing, evoking, and planning. And then to name the four core interviewing skills of MI, uh, many of you already know those in the acronym of ORS, um, and we're not going to delve deeply into those, but just be able to name those. So I thought I'd start with a quiz, uh, thinking that you probably uh, stayed up all night studying for this. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, please put your fingers on your keyboards, and uh, I'll, I'll ask you to answer as quickly as possible when you know the answer to the question, all right? So the first question is, is this MI? And before I show you an image, I'm, I'm actually I just want to say that motivational interviewing is a fairly long term to say repeatedly, so I'm just going to reduce it to MI. But what do you all think? Is this MI? Anybody can uh, tell what that is? I see the yes and the no's, but what about the uh, what is it? Michigan. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> all right. uh, it is MI, but it's not exactly what we're here to talk about. How about this one? Again. What, what is this? Uh, for those of you medical folks, this should come pretty easily. Uh, it is a heart. Uh, it's also a myocardial infarction. Thank you, Kirza, for that. How about this one? Anyone know what this represents? This would be, this might, yeah, 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 Mission Impossible. Thanks, Sal. Good job. Um, all of these are MI, but not why you came here today and not why I came here today, but we are here to talk about uh, this, which is, of course, uh, motivational interviewing. This is the third edition of motivational interviewing, the image you're seeing. If you are uh, not familiar with reading around MI and you want to find something that would be a, a good compilation of all the different concepts and practices of MI, I highly recommend the third edition of motivational interviewing came out in 2013 by Miller and Rolnick. Uh, these days you can probably pick up used copies. Uh, but it, it really is uh, sort of the most updated um, explanation of motivational interviewing based on the ongoing research and the, the learning that uh, we obtain through practice and, and through uh, looking at uh, how things change and concepts change. So. A bit of a history, uh, just out of curiosity, anybody know sort of from what uh, field of practice that MI arose from? And uh, this is something that, uh, yes, yeah, some of you know. Uh, Carl Rogers absolutely uh, arises from that. But it comes from the addiction field. It comes from the field of uh, basically William Miller having uh, been working at a, uh, an inpatient alcohol treatment center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And this is in the 1970s or so. And 
he walked into that treatment center and he hadn't been given much direction. So he walked in and sat down and started talking with people and meeting with them and getting to know them. And these were all men in this case from Wisconsin. And so they talked a lot about fishing and the Green Bay Packers and cheese heads and things like this. Uh, but in the long run, <clears throat> he also learned about their families, about what their desires were. He also learned about their drinking and he came to realize that, you know, these, these men were very aware of the consequences of their drinking, even though they would say things that minimize that at times. And then he says, I, I made the mistake, quote unquote, of going and reading the literature about alcoholics. And uh, again, I'd invite you to tap, to type in the chat box. What are some of the things that you may have uh, heard people saying in the literature or just in passing about alcoholics, particularly back in the 1970s and 80s? What, what kinds of things uh, were being said in treatment centers? That there was a weakness of character, yes. They were living in denial. They couldn't even acknowledge or, and, and um, kind of see the consequences of their actions. They were dishonest. They were pathological liars, they, they were called, and, and so on and so forth. And it was a moral issue primarily. So. This was the, the milieu that William Miller walked into, and he said, wow, this isn't jiving with, with the, the kind of uh, conversations I've been having with these people. And so it was really out of that that he kind of stepped away and, and began doing research and created this, this notion that he called motivational interviewing. He, he later said, I wish I would just call it motivational conversation, uh, but nonetheless, what emerged from that and then consequent, uh, subsequent uh, research was this, this very robust concept around how we can talk with people about change in a way that is most likely to create a motivation within for them to make change. And so to this point, uh, while it started in addictions, uh, many of you know that motivational interviewing has now permeated all of health and human services and corrections and schools, anywhere where people are having conversations with others about things that uh, perhaps need to change or uh, about things that they're, they're just confused about or have a dilemma about and, and need to be able to talk out loud and work it through. So I want to show you a brief video here, and Marsha, who's in the background here, is going to slip the video into the slide here. And this is William Miller, uh, who is talking in a two-minute video about MI and the role that we play in motivational interviewing. So uh, one thing I'll ask you, and Marsha has typed this in the chat box, but please, 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 if you're listening uh, through your phone, uh, please mute your phone and listen through the computer speaker. And I'll, I'll do the same thing, and I'll see you in two minutes. Fundamentally, motivational interviewing involves a change in role, a change in how you think about what you're doing. You're not the expert there to fix the person. You don't have to make the person change. The truth is, in fact, that you can't make a person change. You don't have to be the one to come up with all the good ideas. A person with really good ideas is sitting across from you and may have better ideas than you do. It's not like a competitive sport. It's, it's not like wrestling where you try to defeat and pin and outsmart and outwit the person. It's more like dancing together, moving together, adjusting your movements to the other person. Overall, Motivational interviewing is not a directive approach. Neither is it just a following approach. Following is listening to the person and kind of going wherever they go. Motivational interviewing is in the middle between those two. And we describe it as guiding. If you go to another country and you hire a guide, you don't expect the guide just to follow you around. That's not what you're looking for. Neither do you expect the guide to order you when you will arrive, when you will leave, what you want to see, what you will enjoy, what you're going to do. That's, that's not a good guide either. Good guiding involves good listening as well as using your own expertise. A good guide will find out 
where you want to go, what you're interested in, uh, what you're hoping for on this, you know, on this journey, and then help you get there using his or her own expertise, enjoyably, safely, efficiently perhaps. That's the guide's job. Not solely directing, not solely following, there's some of each in it, but it's a blend of those things. This may or may not be the way you've been thinking about your own work, but we invite you to try it out. All right. So um, I'm sorry for those of you who were not able to hear. Uh, we're going to be showing another video. And again, hopefully it will work if you mute your phone, if you're coming in by phone, and turn all the way up your, your computer speakers. Uh, for those of you who did hear it, um, I, I, I trust that you picked up sort of the, the difference of MI between most helping approaches. Uh, instead of hearing about a person's problem and then coming up with possible solutions and offering them to people, you can already tell this is a different approach in which we're actually asking people to come up with their own answers, their own solutions, to talk themselves into changing, if you will. So. Um, all right, let's continue. Um, what, what I'd love to do is to actually provide you with a personal opportunity uh, for me to be your counselor for the next two or three minutes and uh, have you answer a few questions that I have. And, and this is not exactly the way MI works, but I am going to ask you a few key questions in order to ask you to come up with some of your own answers, if you will, around the dilemma. So, Please think of something that you yourself are currently wrestling with. Maybe it's something you've been wrestling with for a long time or maybe a short time, but something you've been thinking about changing, and yet you haven't changed yet. And you kind of go back and forth. You're ambivalent about it. Uh, it might be a behavior. It might be a health-related behavior. It could be something like exercise or diet, but it also could be an attitude. It could be an attitude of perfectionism or unforgiveness or uh, pretty much anything. Um, and so uh, if you would have that in mind, and we're not going to ask you to share that in the, in the chat box, so this is for you to hold on to, but, but please answer uh, these questions if you would. Um, and, and so the first of these is why might you want to make this change? And we'll just take a few 20 seconds or so. But what are the reasons why you might want to make this change? Another way of asking is what would be some benefits to you? So those of you typing in, thank you. Yeah, your sanity is one. And, and, and so, yeah, uh, working with others, improved relationships, health, balanced life, eating habits. And of course, uh, you know, we, we can take this wherever we want in our lives. It could be have to do with addictions. It could be have to do with uh, your own maybe mental health challenges uh, and, and how to approach treatment. So lots and lots of uh, sharing. Unburdening is one reason that a, a benefit. So wonderful. Yeah, we, there's lots there, isn't there? How about this? How might you go about making this change if, if you decided to do so? in order to be successful. And, and here, the, the point is that there are many pathways to change, many pathways to recovery, many pathways to success. What do you think would work for you? you just think about that for a few minutes. And again, feel free to share in the chat box if you want um, or not. It's fine. So, how might you go about it? And, and some of you probably are choosing uh, lots of different ways, but uh, somewhere in there, there's creating a plan, and a short-term plan, a long-term plan. Some of you are bringing someone else to help as a, an accountability partner. Uh, maybe just try something different than what you've been trying. Uh, and then more specifically, maybe it's about meditation. Maybe it's about researching on the internet. It might be about uh, seeking counseling uh, and all kinds of things. But again, uh, this is not asking you to make the plan, but just to brainstorm how you might do it. Thirdly, I would ask you the question, what, what are your three best reasons to make this change? So you, you may have had quite a few reasons, but what, 
would be the ones that rise to the top. In other words, in level of importance, what would be the three best reasons for you? And again, no need to chat, uh, put it in the chat, but you're welcome to. We, uh, it, it does actually help others think about this as well. So uh, some of it, you know, is around self-care. Some it's for the benefit of others, your children and others around you, uh, for your physical health, your mental health, your relationships, all of these things. Uh, yeah, this is, these are very common and typical reasons to make these changes. And you might have your own unique ones. So a fourth of five questions I want to ask is, who is it that might be able to support you? Again, you, you could just say, you know, an aunt, an, an uncle, or a friend, but you could also, in your own mind, get very specific and say, ah, yes, uh, Harriet, George, <laughs> Juan could, could all support me. Uh, or maybe it's a support group. Or maybe it's a resource that you could rely upon. But uh, here, here are some other things to think about. So friends, coworkers, all of these folks. And then the last of these questions I'll ask is, what do you think might be a very next step or two that you could take, perhaps even within the next week or two, to move in the direction of this change? It's not even a full bore commitment. It's just saying, what do you think you could do to inch towards this change that might give you a different perspective? Um, Grocery shop for healthier foods is always a, a good starting point for eating better and, and eating more healthfully. Uh, think about, uh, yeah, tiny steps, as, as you're saying, Christine, is, is really the way change happens for most people. It rarely happens in one big aha, although you might have an aha and then break it down into parts. Uh, but here, here you have a variety of things open to you, and some might not even work but then you can step back and take another step. So I'm going to pause here and, and just say there are other questions, certainly, that we might ask in motivational interviewing. But the reason for some of these questions is we're really getting at your own motivation to change, which is about what we're doing in mo motivational interviewing is, is trying to tap into your own already existing motivation that we're just calling forth from you. And then we go from there. Now, I do want to say something here. In motivational interviewing, there are times when we might add a suggestion, ask permission to say, would it be all right with you if I, I share an idea that you may or may not find useful, but I'd like to share it? And then if they say yes, you share it. So there's absolutely a place for your input. But nonetheless, primarily the input in MI is coming from the client in herself. The beauty of this approach is you don't have to be qualified, if you will, certified. You don't have to be highly educated. Uh, all you really need to be is human and, and have a, comp a, 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 sorry, a curious, uh, shall we say, a compassionately curious interest in other people and a willingness to be humble enough not to brag about all the good answers that you've got, but instead to approach the person and find out what their own answers are for themselves. We also know that in this approach, what we're doing is we're not necessarily trying to fix issues from the past or the present, although those things come up. But what we're trying to do is, is look face forward and help people envision a different future and envision a way to move beyond where they are, a way to eat more healthfully, exercise more uh, in the future. And, and that in and of itself may well help solve some of the concerns that you're having, whether that's about weight or about uh, feeling depressed or, or all of those things. But we're really focusing on kind of a can-do approach. Now, this can also be attitudinal as well. So we're talking about a collaborative conversation style. It's not a script. But it's a style of talking with people in, in order to help identify and then strengthen a person's own motivation and commitment to change. The belief in motivational interviewing is that we are much more likely to be motivated by that which comes from within and that which we identify rather than from external sources telling us 
what we should do. It's also a person-centered approach, a counseling approach that really addresses what we call the, the, the common problem of ambivalence, which is really this idea of feeling two ways about things. Uh, you know, here's a, a definition, the simultaneous existence of contradictory feelings and attitudes. The fact is that this is something that we all experience. It's totally normal. You're probably ambivalent about something right now, maybe even about being on this webcast when you could be doing other things. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, and every time you approach a dessert table and you say, oh, I really shouldn't, that's an ambivalent statement because the other part is either I'm going to anyway or and I'm not going to. Uh, but ambivalence itself is part of the change process. It's part of being human. What, what becomes problematic is when we get stuck there and we go back and forth and back and forth and, and we seem to get really stuck. You may have seen this symbol. Uh, it's kind of the Nike symbol, but it's kind of not. It's a little distorted. Uh, here, here's what it stands for. So I, I think all of us have had the experience of saying to ourselves, uh, yeah, I, I really kind of want to, but not really. <laughs> and, and this is the end of one experience. And sometimes, you know, the strength of one side is stronger than the others. Uh, you know, we might say, yeah, I, I don't think I'll ever do that. And yet, there might be a little bit of, but maybe there's a tiny bit of me that maybe would consider it under the right circumstances. So ambivalence comes in many forms, but it, it's what we focus on, if you will, in MI, rather than focusing on the notion of being in denial, because being in denial suggests that you're not aware of your problems. And of course, when I mentioned earlier these treatment settings where William Miller went, uh, the way they actually tried to treat people because of uh, their immoral or, or their moral imperfections, if you will, because of their chronic lying, because of their so-called, and because of all of these uh, deficits they had, is they would actually confront heavily and argue and shame people in, a, in an effort to break down this wall of denial so that people would, once the wall was gone, magically be ready for change. And as you can imagine, that uh, did not work so well. What it really did is engendered a lot of conformity in order to not be shamed, and conformity to rules, conformity to saying yes, but, uh, but it, it didn't actually uh, create lasting change for people. So another video, again, please uh, mute your phone line if you're on the phone, turn up your speakers. And this is a little more information about ambivalence and the writing reflex, which uh, will be introduced here. All right, let me do my own muting. Let's return to our example of an ambivalent participant who, like most people considering a change, is balancing back and forth between both sides of an issue. Perhaps they want to quit smoking or eat more healthily. To an outside perspective, the choice between changing and not changing may seem clear. And of course, providers naturally want to encourage and argue for the healthier choice. However, when a provider takes up one side of the argument, the participant feels the shift in balance and wants to defend the opposite. The ambivalent participant doesn't start out voicing only one side of the issue. It's a natural reaction to a provider taking up the opposite half of the discussion. It's at this point that participants are often labeled as resistant or in denial, when in reality they are simply working to restore their back and forth ambivalent balance. The provider worries they haven't been clear enough or perhaps haven't provided enough information. The participant responds in kind. Chances are they have collected most of the information and rationales for both sides of the issue. They are not in short supply. The provider becomes insistent, believing that if they can make the participant feel the weight of the consequences, they will come over to the other side. But as research shows, people put the most weight in their own words. They believe what they hear themselves say over what others say. And when confronted with the writing reflex, they hear themselves arguing for all the reasons not to change. 
When this happens, the writing reflex response is to, as stated in Motivational Interviewing 3rd Edition, confront the person with reality, provide the solution, and when you meet resistance, turn up the volume. Such behavior can result in the participant actually convincing themselves they really don't want to change and even leaving the conversation or treatment setting altogether. This can reinforce a provider's belief that the participant was not ready to change after all, when in fact, it's not a question of readiness to change. It's a question of how comfortable the practitioner is with embracing the artful balancing act of ambivalence. All right. Thank you, Marcia, for that. Um, so, interestingly, the writing reflex, which we also all possess, and it's very natural and normal, is that when we see somebody going in a particular direction, we just want to turn them around, right? Uh, and, and that is a good impulse. What's not so helpful is that when, in fact, and, and I'll just give you an example from the research. Uh, if, if you tell somebody who's got a serious drinking problem, you've got to stop drinking. And then your physician tells, a physician tells you the, the person the same thing. And then maybe your spouse or your partner and then other people. And, and constantly you're barraged with this messaging, you've got to stop drinking. You've got to stop drinking. We know from the research that many people, well, I, I will say 5 or 10% of people might actually stop drinking as a result of hearing that again and again. The other 90% are most likely to actually not only continue drinking, but actually go and, can, and drink even more than they had been drinking before. And as you can imagine, there's something about autonomy and being able to control your life and not being controlled by others that really I think is at the heart of that. It's not even that the person doesn't want to stop drinking themselves. It's just that they're saying, I'll be darned if you're going to tell me what to do. And, and it's one of those places where they're going to put down their foot and say, nope, not here. I'm going to exercise my own free will, my own choice, et cetera. The simplest way to think about MI is it's a way to help people talk themselves into changing. And so we become the catalyst for asking good questions, listening well, and helping guide them through this process of exploring whatever the, the dilemma is that they're looking at. How does this work? Well, this is a very simplistic example, but you and I both talk ourselves into changing when we do choose to change. And we probably do it by examining our own behaviors. We look at it through the lens of how do we want things to be different? What are we concerned about in terms of how our behavior is affecting others? Uh, what priorities, what values, who, who do we want to be in the world? And, and so there's probably some dissonance between your behavior, your attitude, and who you want to be. And out of that, conversation with yourself and or with somebody else will emerge what we'll call preparatory change talk or statements that aren't yet ready for change, but they suggest that you do have reasons and, and an ability to change and it's important to you. So you might map that onto those questions I asked you uh, earlier on about your own issue that I asked you to, to talk to yourself about. Uh, you, you came up with some preparatory change talk there and you heard yourself say that. And then you might even hear yourself say things like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to. And, and so that very last question I asked around what next steps might you take was actually moving us towards uh, planning or mobilizing or a call to action. Have you ever met this girl? You don't have to answer, but uh, chances are you have. Uh, maybe you even are this girl, even if you're a guy or whoever you are. Uh, it might also be that this person lives with you. Uh, but what would you say are the, her negative characteristics, her deficits? And, and feel free to type those in. And, you know, you might say she's stubborn or she's bratty or what, what else might you say to describe her uh, from a, a deficit lens? Um, thanks for the confessions there about it being you. But she's headstrong, cranky, stubborn, resistant. She's a whiner. Yeah, she's all of these things, right? She's spoiled, willful, set in her ways. Um, in a, a medical uh, kind of system, she would be non-compliant or non-adherent, perhaps. 
but she's certainly not open. She's not ready. She's ready for a fight. So you, you get the idea. Um, so so let's, let me show you a picture of a different girl. Uh, and there, by the way, are some, some more examples. Um, but here's a different girl. And, and I'm going to ask you now to talk about what, what do you see in her that you really admire, that you appreciate, that you think is really positive about her? What are some of those characteristics that you see? Um, she's strong, isn't she? And resolute and confident and firm in her beliefs. She wants to be heard. She's expressive. She's determined, bold. Yeah, she's all of these things, isn't she? And, and more. And she's willing to speak truth to power and, and all of these things. Um, <clears throat> Basically, it, it comes down to a question of how do we see? And, um, you know, she can be all of the things that we just mentioned uh, e on either side, but it really depends on the lens through which we ourselves are seeing her. And so that's a really important kind of uh, recognition in MI that how we see people will have an influence on how they see themselves. And so if we see people primarily as in their deficits and that they need to be fixed somehow, they'll hear that. And of course, that's a very disempowering way to see oneself. On the other hand, if we see them also, maybe we don't ignore deficits entirely by any means, but we also see them as strong and competent and able to make changes, then they will borrow that for themselves as well. We might illustrate this through this uh, two glasses scenario. Uh, let's call the first glass on the left as being filled with water or something. And we'll say the one on the right is, is empty. How do you see your clients? Are they relatively empty and we need to fill them with things? Or are they already filled with lots of things? And from an MI perspective, we actually see them as already filled, just like you and I are. But we're filled with a combination of hurts and hopes, nightmarish things and dreams, healthy dreams. We're all kind of attached to uh, in unhealthy ways to things or addicted. But we also have healthy desires. I think we're all delusional. I am. Uh, but we're also wise uh, many times. We're impaired. We're strong and so on and so forth. So. So we're working with people who already are filled with all of these things. And the idea of MI is not so much that we have to fill them further, but we want to evoke from them what we already see in them. So we might elicit or evoke from them, what are your concerns? What are the things that are giving you problems these days? But we want to also evoke, what are your dreams? What are your hopes? What are you... What would be your some reasons why you might want to move in a different direction? So the evoking goes in all these different directions. But again, it's calling forth from the person. The idea here is that people already are wise. They're already filled with plenty of wisdom about themselves and knowledge and life experience. And all we need to do, in, for the most part, is provide positive conditions for them to talk out loud about that in a safe way that they don't feel shamed or judged. And again, in that process of hearing yourself sort of put these ideas out, when you put it into words and put it out there, you hear it in a different way. Another quote from MI, which I, I so love, is, you already have what you need, and together we will find it. Uh, you might not say that directly to some, per some people, but it, it actually is the attitude set of MI, that you already have pretty much everything you need and together we'll find it. Yes, you as the practitioner might have information to add, you might have some other things, but when it comes to motivation, people have got it inside them. It just sometimes gets, it gets covered over, doesn't it? With trauma, with racism, with sexism, with homophobia, with past histories of, uh, you know, abuse, but, but also maybe of uh, mental health challenges and substance use disorders and, and physical illness. So, so a lot of times the motivation that people have and when they come to us and say, oh, I, 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 I just don't think I can do this, we don't take that at face value entirely. In the moment, the person doesn't feel that way. But if we create the conditions, that we can have a conversation about that, it's very, very likely we'll start hearing 
some possible areas where the person feels somewhat hopeful and even able to make changes. Another quiz. Have you ever changed anyone? Please type in the type chat box. It's really a yes or no question. Have you ever changed anyone? So I see a capitalized no and lots more no's. Uh, no, no, no is the answer of the day, apparently. Uh, I guess I'm not seeing any yeses. Okay. Well, the answer to the question is actually yes, you have. Uh, I don't know why my slide's not advancing, but uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, but you haven't changed anybody else. Oh, my, my, my. Okay, come back. I, <laughs> little technical things going in here. Uh, the, the answer is yes, we've changed someone, but it, it's been ourselves only. And we're the only ones who can change ourselves. But we actually literally cannot change another person. That I know you're already asking the next question, can you make a difference? And absolutely we can. And that's where really where the power that we have in the relationship lies, in our ability to create conditions for the person to explore their own situation and then ask key questions, listen well, and in that process, people come up with their own answers. This is one of my favorite quotes. They say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But I say you can salt the oats. Madeline Hunter. In other words, we can make, create the conditions under which people are thirsty for change rather than being parched uh, and feeling more hopeless. Why is this relevant at all for your work? I'm just going to name these things and move ahead. That there's lots of evidence-based, so lots of research around this method. Uh, it's a way to practice compassion and kindness in a skillful way. We know that it is effective across many populations and cultures. Many people with different backgrounds, uh, professional degrees or none at all, can practice MI. We also know that it can be extremely, not extremely, but it can be very effective in, in brief encounters. And, and when I say brief, I'm even talking about five or 10 minute encounters. And in some ways, I think maybe you can, can relate to that if in fact, the little exercise we did earlier where I asked you those five questions, if that had any impact on your thinking at all, and you might walk away thinking further about those things, then you can see how a very brief encounter actually can can have a, an effect. We know that this is an approach that outperforms our traditional advice giving. Um, people are now actively involved in their own care. They're not just passive recipients. They stay in care longer. You and I are healthier help human beings and helpers, I think, because the burden is not on us to make things change or get people to change. It's really on that person, but our responsibility is to make it as easy as possible for them to, to explore that. And this is a very hopeful, and, and it's an approach that really does foster lasting change. What it's not is just being nice or tricking people or just techniques. It's not a cure-all. Uh, it's not the same as the trans-theoretical model. Uh, of the stages of change, although there's certainly some connection there that we can make. And, and the interesting thing about MI is when you observe it, it actually kind of looks easy. But when you practice it, it gets a little harder. And, and it's not unlearnable by any means, but it is a little bit harder to learn than, than at first glance. Because I'm guessing that many of you are saying, oh, I, I already kind of think this way and practice this way and do these things. And, and it's true, you do. And at the same time, uh, to become pretty proficient at this approach requires practice with feedback, with coaching oftentimes. So a little bit about the spirit of MI, also known as the, a mindset or a heart set. And, and this comes from uh, Miller and Rolnick who say that, you know, when they first started teaching motivational interviewing back in the 1980s, they tended to focus on asking open questions, teaching people to re listen reflectively, to summarize all of these things. And they said what they found over time that something, a key ingredient was missing. And as they watched people practicing, 
they realized that it, it was almost as if they had taught them the words but not the music, which is a, a lovely metaphor, I think. Um, that, that people were doing things technically correct, but there wasn't kind of that spirit that infused the conversation, infused the relationship. And so spirit is really focusing on the relational part of the helping relationship, not on the knowledge part or technical part. It comes in four forms, uh, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. Uh, very briefly, I'll just say um, partnership is, is really a key element of how we approach people. Do we approach them as we're the expert, you're the recipient, or do we approach them as you have expertise, I have expertise. Let's bring that together and let's level the playing field here so that we both see how we can work together uh, to help you think through this situation. We often think of partnership as appearing like a side-by-side -side relationship. I think that uh, kind of 45 degree angle relationship is actually a, a helpful thing to think about because it, it's not face-to-face, -face, which can be confrontive or overly intimate. And it's not back-to-back, -back, of course, which is too distant, but it's this side-by-side. -side. And, and that's really the, the, the appearance, the, the, the imagery of partnership. And the language of partnership sounds like, I, I look forward to working with you. Let's, how can we together uh, kind of explore this? And, and how can I support you in this process? and so on and so forth. So partnership is, is absolutely critical, and it's, it's a shift in the power uh, arrangement of the relationship, and, and it's an important shift because when people aren't being overpowered by the expert in the room, if you will, they're being empowered in order to be able to see that they already have everything they need, and together we're going to find that. Acceptance is the second element, which is also broken down into uh, the notion of these four things. The first being uh, prizing people for their inherent worth and potential. Um, one of the things that often comes to my mind is a quote by Buckminster Fuller, who said, there's nothing about a caterpillar that would suggest it will turn into a butterfly. And I think that speaks to the fact that when we see people in our work settings or on the streets or wherever we are, we tend to go to the deficit lens, but can we also see people for their potential? By way of illustration, I, I share this image with you. This is Edwin Gibbons, um, who has gone public with his own personal story. But Edwin lived for 20, 25 years or so on Skid Row in Los Angeles. I think just in looking at him, uh, we can see that, that he's not wearing well, if you will, physically or emotionally or psychologically. Uh, lots going on with him, lots and lots going on with him. It turns out that Edwin, through a housing first approach, was offered housing without requiring him to get sober, get medical treatment, get uh, mental health treatment. He was simply offered the basics of a a roof over his head and food and some uh, being able to be around other people and to access things that he needed on his own timing. But on his own time, he eventually, while in housing, said, you know, would somebody please help me get into detox? And of course, the staff did offer that and he went. He stayed there. He ultimately entered into some form of treatment. I don't know what that looked like. But what I do know is the Ed who emerged some years later was this individual. And this is an, uh, a before and after imagery, if you will, uh, that I think uh, just so clearly illustrates the fact that people have incredible potential that we often miss, that we don't even see for ourselves. But I think we have to continue to believe in people that they can make changes, even though not everybody that we believe in will make those changes. But I think this is extremely hopeful from my point of view. Acceptance also has everything to do with providing accurate empathy. We know that empathy is what makes 
the world go round in terms of, of helping relationships. And uh, we offer empathy oftentimes through reflective statements in motivational interviewing that sound something like, that sounds really complicated, or you're really feeling hurt and confused about that, or a reflection of ambivalence. Part of you wants to cut back, and part of you isn't so sure you could cut back, or you're hoping for a better result, and, and more and more. This is a, a video that I'm not going to show, but I recommend to you if you haven't seen it. It's about five or six minutes, produced by the Cleveland Clinic. If you type in Google, empathy, the human connection to patient care, it will come up. I'll just say a, a fair forewarning that uh, the, the, the video can be triggering, actually, because it portrays circumstances that are common to circumstances that are part of human life. Uh, that's hard circumstances, but it's also very hopeful and, and very compelling. So uh, if you haven't seen it or maybe you have, I, I highly recommend uh, watching it. Autonomy support is the another component part of acceptance. When we honor people's ability to choose for themselves and we say things like, this is a decision only you can make, for example. Uh, you recall the, the illustration I gave of the guy who they kept saying, you've got to stop drinking, you've got to stop drinking, you've got to stop drinking. Uh, what would have happened had the approach been, you know, I, I really have some concerns about your drinking. I wonder uh, if, if you share any of those concerns, and if so, what they might be. Uh, and then we might say, you know, and I, I wanted to say to you, regardless of my concerns, I recognize that only you can decide whether or not this is a change you want to make. And I'm here to support you, but I can't make that for you. That would be the messaging that would be more likely to give this person an opening to even consider making a change and, and help him be more thirsty through salting the oats uh, for the possibility of change. We also affirm strengths. We use the term a lot these days about being strength-based. Well, Yes, it's, it's a good thing. And being strengths-based is really noticing all the good stuff we see in people and commenting on some of it. Uh, we, we don't want to overload people with, oh, you are this and that. Uh, it, it's really just a genuine statement of something that I see in you, uh, such as you showed a lot of courage, but rather than stopping there, in the way that you, and then describe what you observed. Because that takes it from a generic, you're courageous, which you could say to anybody at certain times, to a very specific description. You showed a lot of courage in the way you spoke up in that meeting and, and said something that had to be said. You took a lot of, that, that took a lot of patience on your part to sort of hang in there with that person who was really, uh, doing a lot of uh, confronting you, and yet you, you listened to what was going on and reflected back what you heard, uh, good for you, and so on and so forth. Compassion, the third element of spirit. And compassion is, uh, and anybody know the literal meaning of the word passion, just out of curiosity? Um, you get extra points if you get it right. Uh, or not, but uh, the, the term passion itself uh, literally means suffering. Thank you, Sherry, right on cue. Uh, it literally means suffering. Like in the Christian tradition, Passion Week is the week of suffering. And calm, of course, means with. So, so compassion means a lot of different things, but it, it at some deep level means walking alongside people in their suffering, in their homelessness, in their addiction, in their just confused state, and, and being willing to be there in solidarity with them, not that we become the suffering, but we walk alongside people in the suffering and acknowledge it. And the key is that we avoid trying to make it all better, to fix it. Because what that does when we say things like, oh, it will all get better, or time heals all wounds, or all the things we say, right, to make, make it all better. One, it's addressing our own anxiety, usually. And two, 
it's really dismissive of the pain and suffering people are having. And what it does, paradoxically, is it often frees people up to begin moving ahead into looking at ways of healing because somebody noticed, somebody acknowledged it, somebody was willing to walk alongside without trying to make it all better. I, I trust that you are finding ways in your own work to come alongside people in their suffering and allowing for enough space and time so that they know that you see them, you hear them, uh, you, you, you understand the trauma, if you will, that they're going through. And then, of course, in due time to move forward. Another quote. You might have noticed by now I like quotes. Here's what we seek. A compassion that can stand in awe at what people have to carry instead of standing in judgment about how they carry it. And this is the spirit of MI. What does it sound like? Sometimes it sounds like nothing at all. It's sitting there silently with somebody. Sometimes it's saying, can I just sit here for a bit with you? Uh, can I bring you some soup, some salad, some chicken, whatever? Uh, it, it, it's just, it's an action. Compassion is an action. Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily a frenzied action. It's being present to people in a meaningful way. A good meme for our days and times. Evocation is the fourth of this spirit piece, and evocation, of course, uh, is, is really at the heart of this approach, as you, I think, already have heard and seen. What we're doing is we're seeing people as already having lots of experience and wisdom and knowledge, and we're eliciting that from people. And then, yes, there are times when we're adding to that with permission by, by providing some other perspectives. But, but as you can see on balance, the idea is in, in MI is that we begin with drawing out from people what it is that they have inside. You've already got what you need, and together let's find it. And it will often sound like, tell me more about what would you like me to know about yourself, what concerns, if any, do you have about um, you're wanting to be a better friend. That's a reflection, but it actually evokes from the person because they, they would often say, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I want. I want to be somebody who's there for them and so on and so forth. If you were to change, what would be your reason? So all of the questions that I ask, those five questions that I ask in our little mini MI session were all ways of evoking from you your own responses to those things. So here we have them again. Uh, you might see an acronym in here. You might not, but uh, your call. Uh, but I, I've spent a fair amount of time here on MI spirit because without MI spirit, it's not MI. And sometimes MI spirit itself, actually, is almost enough for people to move in a direction uh, of positive change because they have felt and seen, been seen, and been mirrored, if you will, and, and, and when that happens for all of us, it really helps lift our ability to see possibilities. Now, as we begin to wrap up, I want to also touch on the fact that there are important core skills that we use in motivational interviewing. Uh, you've probably heard of the ORs. Uh, so open questions versus Closed questions are likely to uh, evoke more open answers. Uh, so uh, it might be uh, all kinds of things we might ask. Uh, you know, what, what would you like to talk about today? What would you like to focus on? If you were to decide to move in this direction, what might be some of the, the reasons or benefits from doing so? How might you do it? Uh, who could help you? How confident are you? that you could do this. What might be the, and, and here's another kind of open question that we might ask sometimes, and this might sound odd to your ears initially, but what are the good things, or what are the, uh, what, what does uh, smoking meth do for you? 
might be another form of open question because in part what it, it does is it also naturally would lead and, and what does it not do for you or what are your concerns about it? Uh, the belief here is that people engage in behavior because they're trying to meet a need and it might be destroying them in lots of different ways in their relationships, but initially at very most, it, it started out as a way of trying to meet a need and we want to understand that intention, if you will. Affirmations are ways that we name strengths. Reflections are ways that we reflect back to people what they're saying. Uh, and summaries are like a collection of reflections. I, I do say sometimes that if the oars were a four-part rock and roll band, let's say the Beatles, uh, that reflections would be the lead singer. It, it's the most important skill of motivational interviewing. Open questions, uh, also very important, kind of up there playing lead guitar, if you will, if you're willing to go with my analogy. And then affirmations and summaries, very important, but they're more in the background, they're in the percussion session, they're, they're uh, playing the bass, whatever. Uh, they're used less frequently, but reflections actually are the ones that hopefully are used most frequently in this approach. And then we use these across these processes of a conversation, which begin with what we call engaging, getting to know the person, learning their story, uh, hearing both their concerns, but also what are the things that uh, that make them happy? What are the things that uh, you do well? What are some of the strengths you have? Uh, tell me about what's important to you. What are the values that you hold to uh, in your life? Uh, we can ask all kinds of things in the in the spirit of getting to know people in order to engage with them. Now, if we only did this, then it would not be MI, but it would be a great start to MI. But what we ultimately want to do is find a focus. So you mentioned that you have some concerns about your relationship with your partner. You also mentioned that you, you have been uh, struggling to, to keep up with your diabetes and your blood sugars. Uh, you also said that you've been using a little bit more recently. Uh, maybe there are other things, but where should we start? What, what would you like to focus on in the time we have together today? Because in focusing, we narrow down the various things going on in people's lives and, and come to a place that's concrete enough that we can then begin to evoke and say things like, so if you were to uh, maybe check your blood sugars more frequently, uh, what would be benefits of doing that? And how might you go about doing that? And, and what kind of reminders or what equipment or, or what would be helpful for you? Who could help you? And so on and so forth. And then eventually we would perhaps come to planning, even if planning is no more than saying, what do you think is the next step you could take? So it doesn't have to be a full-fledged service plan, although it could be, but planning is really just moving towards the next steps. Now, the problem in MI, or the problem in, in life in general, is we often go directly from focusing to planning. And as somebody says, well, I'm feeling uh, concerned about my drinking. And the next question out of our mouths is, well, what are you going to do about it? Or maybe even not with that snide man. But uh, it, it's that kind of thing that we, we don't want to do. We will instead want to focus in on the evoking process. Key ideas. This is a, an expert-to-expert -expert relationship. It's very much driven by acceptance and compassion, uh, but with skill. And we recognize that we're not imposing anything. We can't get people to change, but we can invite them to consider change. We also know that direct persuasion rarely, if ever, is helpful, and that we use a guiding more than a directing style or even a passive style. And uh, we also um, know that the task of the client is to resolve their own ambivalence. It's not for us to do. So I want to say thank you. And I just want to uh, slip in a slide here. Oh, you know what? I forgot to do that. Never mind. I, what I want to say to you is that um, this is being brought to you, of course, by C4 Innovations. We have developed a whole uh, menu of options, if you will, around MI learning. Some of them are self-paced. 
Uh, some of them are beginner level, some of them are more moderate or even advanced level. Some involve taping your practice and having it coded and receiving coaching. Uh, all kinds of options online uh, and someday maybe on site again, uh, but for obvious reasons we're not offering on site training right now. So uh, we invite you to go to the website, uh, C4 Innovations, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. It's been fun to be with you and I hope you have a, a wonderful day. Uh, Deanna, very shortly, uh, very quickly, uh, how does MI differ from harm reduction? Uh, they actually go hand in hand. You can't do MI without believing in harm reduction. I could say a whole lot more about that, but uh, they, they're very much a hand in glove fit. So, all right. Take good care, everyone. See you.